So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us to discuss collecting in New York pre and post pandemic with our illustrious panelists. Um, this conversation is pegged to the release of a new report by Claire McAndrew of Arts Economics uh, produced by Independent Art Fair and the art logistics firm Crozure. Um, and it is sort of the first of its kind looking at what makes New York tick as, a, um, as an art center, as a market center, as a collecting hub. Uh, and so to put some human faces uh, to a report that has a lot of numbers, we have invited um, three New Yorkers uh, to join us to speak about what it means to, to live and look at art in New York. Um, uh, three uh, New Yorkers plus a special guest. Uh, we have Susan and Michael Hort. We have um, Wendy Cromwell and Victoria Rogers. Uh, I am going to give you a um, fuller but still very concise bio uh, biography for for them um, at the end of a brief introduction, uh, which I am going to start now with sharing my screen. But I figured that I would start um, talking about New York with the words of our outgoing president who described it as a ghost town uh, and said that it's dying and that everyone is leaving New York. Um, <laughs> A, uh, this report by Claire McAndrew has proven uh, that it will take a lot more than a global pandemic to shut down New York City. Um, and it, it is the first time that we've gotten figures on the size and dynamics of the New York market in particular. Um, it's based on surveys completed by 388 art collectors in the New York tri-state area and 146 um, surveys completed by art advisors. And um, some of the kind of key takeaways just to situate us a little bit, um, it found that 90% of sales in the US take place in New York and the US is the largest share of the global market at 44%. Um, it also found that 40% of fares in the US take place in New York. Um, and it offered a bit of a kind of glimpse into the, the size and scale of um, the collections of those surveyed, um, it found that New York collectors have an average of 146 works of art in their collection, um, and they spend on average $759,000 a year uh, buying art. Um, and so these statistics are very um, uh, kind of abstract as much as they're precise, but, but they are sort of particularly valuable at a time when the market is facing unprecedented stress and um, and people are trying to make decisions about what to do with their careers and their businesses. Um, and, you know, so to contextualize these numbers, we have uh, a few of the real people who are fueling the art ecosystem here with us. So yes, please let me introduce uh, Victoria Rogers, a creative business strategist, MFA candidate at Parsons, trustee at the Brooklyn Museum of Art and Creative Time. Uh, and co-chairwoman of the Black Trustee Alliance for Art Museums. Um, we also have Wendy Cromwell, who is the founder of Cromwell Art LLC, a fine art advisory firm. She is a past president and current board member of the Association of Professional Art Advisors and a board member of the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling in New York. And last but certainly not least, um, Susan and Michael Hort, um, they have been collecting young contemporary art since 1985. They are also the founders of the Rima Hort Mann Foundation, which serves both cancer patients and emerging artists. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Um, so a couple of notes um, for viewers before we dive in. Um, if you have any questions that come up over the course of the conversation, um, we will want to answer them to the best of our ability. Um, so please put them as they occur to you in the Q&A field on the bottom um, right of your Zoom panel at the bottom, um, and we will save some time to get to them at the end. Um, so I want to start with Victoria. 
Um, you grew up in Chicago before moving to New York, and I wonder if you could talk about sort of what collections there informed your approach to collecting now. Sure. Um, I haven't lived in Chicago for 12 years, but looking back on what it was like to be in the arts community there, I think I spent way more time exploring the museums and the Art Institute of Chicago, the Museum of Contemporary Art, like those were really the places where I learned about art the most. Um, but there, there are a couple of collections that stand out. Um, there's a couple, Marty and Anita Nesbitt, who are based in Hyde Park. And I would go to their house sometimes as a child. My parents are friends with them. And they were really the first place where I saw black faces looking back at me. They, they collect a lot of African-American artists. And so for me, that was huge and important to see myself reflected back on their walls. Um, and then another, another house I can think of is Helen, Helen Goldberg, Goldenberg, who was um, the head of Sotheby's Chicago when I was growing up, I interned there. And I remember she had me and the other intern over to her house. And it was the first time when it was unclear to me what was art and what wasn't. Like she lived so much amongst it and with it. And I was like, what can I touch? Where can I sit? And for me, that was another experience where I thought, whoa, like you can live with art in this way. And it doesn't have to be something that is either you're afraid to touch or, or sort of precious about. Um, so those two for me were, were important formative experiences really early on in my life. And I'm sad I haven't been spending more time with Chicago collectors recently, um, but post COVID, I'll, I'll be back to visit. And the first work that you acquired was an Emile Bernard when you were 18. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about sort of how what you look for in art has changed since then and how much that shift may or may not have been informed by being in New York. Sure. Yeah, that, that piece is, is far outside of something I would collect today, but I'm grateful to it because it opened, it opened a door for me um, to have that Helen Goldenberg experience of living with and amongst art. Um, I think I'd written a paper about Sotheby's and went to an auction with my dad and that was the piece that we could afford and that we got. And I think for me, it was, it was super exciting, but sort of disconnected from the artist. Obviously Bernard was dead by the time that we were collecting him. And I think in actually going off to college and learning about MFA programs and being proximate to New York where I could meet artists, that really changed the way I thought about collecting. Um, I remember when I was an undergraduate, there were artists like Eric Mack and Jennifer Packer who were getting their MFAs at the same time that I was getting my undergraduate degree and there were open studios. So I felt like the luckiest person and I could go in and actually meet them and talk to them. And I think for me, that was defining because it led me to commit to supporting living artists, um, particularly artists of color and women and engaging in a relationship with them so that it was less of a, this, this now is my object, but rather, you know, how could I be a part of the career trajectory of someone over time. Um, so prox proximation to artists, I think was the big shift for me. And Susan and Michael, um, I think if, if collecting is a discipline, then you all could uh, fairly be judged to be kind of the Olympic athletes of, of the discipline. Um, and so I wanted to ask first, you know, in a normal non-pandemic November, um, you know, if this were a normal month, what would a regular week of art looking look like for you? Um, and what has it looked like this year? Well, obviously we'd be going to galleries. I'd be going to galleries constantly. We'd be going to art dinners and meeting with other collectors. Flying. <laughs> what year? I'm flying to, oh, yeah. Flying to Basel, Berlin, right. Brussels, Paris. LA, but, Miami. But this year, we occasionally go into a gallery, occasionally do a studio visit very carefully, um, and obviously no art dinners at all. And, you know, the, the art market report found that 84% um, of collectors surveys 
transact at less than $50,000 per artwork, um, even if they spend more than $500,000 on art each year. And you two are known for buying early in an artist's career and buying in debt. And you've also said that until 2000, you purchased work for $5,000 or less. Um, so first, just to make the audience a the, little bit. The artist mm -hmm. other thing, not, not the amount. That is ah. David Hammond's for five thousand dollars, right? He bought a backboard. They, that, that's the fun, right? Not to buy him for yeah. ten million. To sit and talk to David Hammond's about the work when he was friendly, and to uh, and to be maybe his first white collector, who knows? And and then to understand the work as as when we first got it, we thought, well, it's a backboard. He had put it around a high school in Harlem. We dragged it back. It's about basketball, and you know, that's the sport of of the black uh, community in some ways. And then he was at a show at, at uh, PS1. PS1 and he was playing basketball on the backboards and three more that he made that were owned by museums. And the baskets were two feet higher and they were hard and the rims were tighter. And so we thought about it. He wouldn't tell us, of course. And we said, oh, you want it, you got to practice to be good. You know, it's not just playing basketball, you got to practice. So he made the rims higher. So he smiled. And then he was at a museum show in, in uh, San Francisco and they made a catalog of the first time they called it Higher Goals. And we said, wait a minute, Higher Goals? Oh, right. you want to make it, one of these kids to know they were, weren't going to haul and playing basketball. And he smiled and who knows. So that's the fun of it, you know? And I mean, how did you end up developing that approach? How did you decide that that was going to be? We started out buying one piece at a time. Um, and we would listen with our ears. We bought with our ears, you know, we'd hear what the big collectors were buying and then try to get a piece. But also we go to the, the, the studios, the galleries. Right, but then- And get a postcard, they had these yeah. color postcards. And Jack Tilton was early- uh, An early mentor. Early mentor. And we'd bring him the postcard and we'd, we'd talk to him about it. We'd sit down and talk to him about it. You know, and little by little, the idea is if, if you want to collect, what you want to do is get into the community. You want to meet artists, you want to meet these people, you want to meet, you know, people that are interested in this stuff. And they, they'll tell you, they'll say, hey, you got to go see Jennifer Packer, right? Right. You know, she has a thing at, at Yale and then she had a studio. We went to a 120th Street and went to dinner with her. I mean, I only mentioned that because you mentioned it. But the point is that that's the fun of it, you know? Anyone could buy Jennifer Packer if they go to the gallery today and spend And, and have the money. Yeah, but to buy what we did, well, that's pretty cool. Something. So how did you go from buying with your ears to buying with your eyes? Just time. Just by going and looking. You we know, spent every Saturday looking at art. Yeah. We were in the Lower East Side at the time. We were in Soho. East Village. East Lower Village. East Side. Sorry. You're right. East, East Village. Village. East, East Village. Village and Soho and Chelsea, wherever we're Right. And yeah, we go to we go to um, to the MFA shows. Yeah. And if an artist recommends someone, we'll do a studio visit. It's it's just a lot of looking. Yeah, I talk and talking about how, it. And, and that's how we developed what our interest is. Yeah. And you develop an eye too. And you, the more you see, the more you know what's good and what's not, or what might be good and what's not. Well, you know? at least what's good. Do you always agree? Yeah. Yeah. Do you always agree? We don't agree, we don't get it. <laughs> we don't buy I'll, it. I'll tell you this agree. though. Uh, if Susan loves it and I like it, we may get it. <laughs> if she likes it, we never get it. But that's good. Classic. So, we have enough. <laughs> You have like 5,000 pieces, uh, what, what's the difference, right? <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, I wanted to ask you, you know, what proportion of your clients are New Yorkers? And in your experience, do they share any common sort of New Yorker sensibility or kind of goal in collecting? You know, it's a good question. I was thinking about it. Uh, and I would say almost all my clients are New Yorkers, but they don't necessarily live in New York anymore. But there is maybe some kind of, um, I mean, I have a few clients in Chicago and I have a few clients in LA. Um, and I think of them as New Yorkers. You know, that's the funny thing. They're urban and they're sophisticated and a bunch of my LA clients used to be New Yorkers and moved. Um, so um, yeah, most of, I would say like 80%, 85% of my clients actually are New Yorkers and have one address in New York, but they have addresses elsewhere too. So yeah. 
And I mean, do you feel like they, like, do they have anything in common or is it just very much client by client? Um, they're looking for something unique to them. Yeah, I mean, like a, a shared sensibility. I mean, they all have one thing in common, which is the, they collect art, but they have very different sensibilities. And uh, I'm very lucky that way. I've never really had to debate who gets what, who gets offered what thing. It's very, very specific to the individual. And they, I'd say they're all pretty sophisticated people. And um, that doesn't mean that they know a lot about art. They They have, they're very sophisticated in terms of how they live their lives and, and what, and they're curious, they're intellectually curious, um, but they all have a very different point of view, different eye, different mandate and different budgets. So. And I mean, one of the reasons that I think, you know, this report was commissioned in the first place is because, um, you know, the, the country and the world and, and New York are, are sort of in this moment of crisis. Um, and so analyzing sort of what makes uh, the market kick, what makes it resilient might give us clues as to where we'll go next. And, um, and another thing that does that is sort of looking back at the past at previous moments of crisis. And Elizabeth B, who is the founder of Independent, um, you know, has said that the New York market in particular became more conservative in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. And I wondered, you know, having been very active in the market then, Wendy, if you found that to be true and also, you know, how you think the market will evolve in the wake of this well, current crisis. You know, having grown up in New York City and being involved in the art world right from high school internships, I've really seen uh, many different phases of adventurous art and then more classicizing sort of impulse to pull back and become more conservative because that tends to happen every time there's a recession or an economic break to a cycle. So I do agree with Elizabeth that there was a kind of cl um, classicizing moment post 2008 where um, painting became very, very prominent. And, uh, but prior to that, there were, um, there was a lot of kind of acceptance of new mediums from like 2000 to 2008 and, sort of the rise of a drawings market that didn't really exist before in contemporary art in, in the way that it, it came to exist in the late 90s and that kind of spilled over to the 2000s. And there was a um, you know, push into all kinds of um, um, experimental mediums and that has now kind of run out to um, the kind of art that, that we see being more, um, you know, less painting specific, more focused on non-traditional, formerly non-traditional materials for making art. But in 2008, there was this kind of push towards painting. And I think a lot of people in the art economy noticed that, that galleries were having a harder time selling, um, you know, things that were just more experimental in nature. And photography also took a big hit in 2008. You know, there was a big push into photography and large scale color photography, which the contemporary art world hadn't really sanctioned. Like photography wasn't really a thing that many contemporary art collectors bought. It was kind of its own market. And that really changed um, throughout the 2000s. And that market just kind of came to a halt, it, weirdly, in 2008. Um, and I think it was sort of this, this fear among collectors about, you know, um, that painting is, has always been what the market tends to value the highest over time. And so let's put our money, let's be timid, let's put our money where, you know, it's the most sort of safe. And that was the canvas. But it produced some incredible, you know, incredibly talented, amazing painters but now I think we're, we're seeing a, a big return and we have for like the past five to seven years, a big return to non-traditional mediums in, in art. And I mean, do you think that, that we will see a similar sort of pendulum swing after this moment? No, why? I think that this has been from what I've seen coming out of studios, 
throughout the pandemic, this has been the opposite. This has been artists who haven't been able to get into the studio, who are working with whatever's on the kitchen table. So a lot more drawing, amazing drawings have come out of this time. And I'm, I'm curious if you guys, if my four, uh, fellow panelists have also noticed that. And, um, you know, a lot of innovation using these online viewing platforms with, um, you know, showing video. And um, I, I'm, I'm seeing an actual push through this moment into even more experimental terrain from artists. Hmm. Yeah, I think before the pandemic, though, the, the, this happened. We the foundation gives grants to artists. We gave out 16, 17 last year, and it's all from nomination. And early on, we gave grants to artists, mostly painters. A fewer, now, fewer painters. Fewer, maybe we get one out of, out of right. two out of the group. So it's really changed in terms of that. But what really happens is ultimately, the most of these artists ultimately get into painting because that's the only way to pay for their rent long term you know i mean the problem is that a lot of these incredible things are really not collectible by normal people they're collectible by museums we've collected some of those things yeah, and, yeah. and they don't survive they don't survive they don't come out and of storage well you yeah. know there's a difference between <laughs> the collecting but because we, we, we have to have the piece we just gave and, a buying, and buying for investment we just we, we just gave a 20-foot mark dion urban thing to the Whitney Museum, partly we gave it to them because they wanted it, but partly because it was impossible really to, to store. store. They have mm -hmm. no problem. They have, you know, lots of people, hard handlers, whatever. With us, you know, this comes with has squirrels and guts, and, you know, that kind of stuff is very, very hard to collect. Well, the painting is quite easy. But when you said conservative, to me, the word conservative meant money. Right. In 208, a lot of people decided art collecting was the way to make money. And it actually started a few years before that, right. but it really grew after the, uh, the, you know, the, the problems with all the other kinds of, 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 of worthy, at that, up to then, uh, valuable commodities. Were. But those aren't the collecting that we're interested in. Or the, the collectors that we're interested that, in. They're also not the collectors that, that make a difference. Look, no one bought Picasso early because they thought we could make money. People, the people that knew Picasso, I'm sure, loved his work, and they, and that's why they bought it, and they supported him really. You know, later on, he didn't need the help. That's fine, but early on, he needed help like everybody else. And and really, uh, what 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 uh, Victoria is doing is is collecting at the beginning. That's really when you're helpful. You know, we collected Nicole Eisman. Well, you talk about drawings. That's what yeah. Nicole did in the early 90s. Right. She did works on paper. We have two paintings, but her- You have two paintings? We have two paintings from that period. Oh, that period. From yeah. that period. Yeah, but more. her focus was works on paper. Right. So you right. talk about works on paper. I mean, we've always collected works on paper. We, yeah, we have, a lot we of have photography. We have all right. of that. It's yeah. not what we're, we're not looking specifically for this we're looking at the art if you want to make money the art makes affects us right. if, you want, if you want to make money and a lot of collectors that's what they want to do photography is hard because right. the, the photographer makes eight, there are editions there are editions yeah. of eight or whatever they are and and so ultimately very few of them stay up there uh you know for long, long term if you look at the auction houses you'll see you know um but we collect what we love, and um, we collect photography. Some, not as much as- You talked about helping, yeah. helping the artists um, and, and the impulse to collect by helping artists and supporting artists. Um, but that, but in this moment of, of sort of the, the contracting of, of the art world during, during the pandemic, there were a lot of, a lot of collectors who I, I talked with who wanted to support artists in this time um, very, very much so, not just young artists, but artists who um, were established and galleries helping, helping sell that work felt good because it helped to pay the salaries of all the people who I know who work in the galleries yeah. and everybody, the collectors felt really, really positive about that, about supporting the artists, about supporting the galleries in this moment. And we are a community, you know, and you, Susan and Michael, you talk about being part of the community and how important it is to be embedded in that. I think that's one of the, really one of the joys of being 
involved in the market is it's not about money, it's about the community. And we have that in New York. Is being involved in the community. I mean, obviously we're friends with artists, we're friends with dealers, and most of our friends are collectors. I know just a part that we haven't touched upon are the institutions, which are an obvious cornerstone of the community and really important to support alongside them. And I think we've had some questions, it seems like, on the side, which I, I bet we'll get to later, but for folks who are who are interested in how to learn about new artists, institutions are a great place to start to do that and residency programs too. Um, I think it's without the cultural institutions that we know and love, there wouldn't be an arts ecosystem. So I think they're also an important part of this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And actually that makes me think maybe I'll, I'll move one of my questions that is towards the end of my list up, um, which is, you know, and I'll, I'll start with you, Victoria, and then we'll go around. But, um, you know, if you were going to give um, a, an emerging New York art collector a sort of syllabus for uh, museum and gallery going um, in order to become a more confident um, emerging art collector, you know, what would you tell them to do? Yeah, I think we've all talked about the importance of building relationships. And I think supporting institutions or becoming a member even at an institution that is really invested in its community is a great starting point. So places like the Brooklyn Museum or the Studio Museum in Harlem are, are two places that I've really loved, not only because of the shows that they put on, but the community around them that I get to be a part of. Um, so I think that's that would be my first starting point is getting involved in some great local organizations near you. And then we touched on earlier residency programs and MFA programs often have open studio days. So those are amazing chances to get to meet artists, talk to them, ask questions, meet other people who are doing the same thing. I think now a lot of them have to happen digitally. Um, so maybe less serendipity, but still a chance to see behind the curtain a bit and, and learn about it. And that's having... something that anyone can do. Yeah, that's yeah. something that anyone can do, anyone. Um, you know, the annoying part is you have to find all the residencies and, and sort of research when the open studios are, but um, if you're willing to do that, you can go. And I also think the last thing I'll mention is Instagram, which I think is especially great at being able to see what other artists are looking at. So if you find a few people that you really love and want to follow their careers, it's smart too to see who do they follow, what are they posting, um, and then you can kind of expand your network of knowledge that way. And Susan and Michael, what about you? If you were going to draft a uh, syllabus or a curriculum, well, we what would it look like? Obviously, um, MFA programs is very important, but you have to go to the galleries too and yeah. really look at what the galleries are showing. There are young galleries, a lot of young, really interesting galleries. Like, uh, we like 1969, Lyles, King, Lyles and King, just to name two. I mean, you really see interesting, interesting people. And, uh, you know, it, the, the Studio Museum used to be great before the construction. <laughs> Yeah, closed right now. It'll open it will be and again. be many, many times bigger, bigger or significantly bigger. And we met many artists that we collected there in their residency, including Kindy Wiley. Actually, the first time we saw Kindy was right. in the studio, the studio museum many years ago. Um, but you know, it, it, it's really getting out there. I'm telling you, it's 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 not hard if you are if you're interested. If you go to openings of of, of white columns and. 1969, you'll, you'll meet people, you'll talk to them, you'll talk to the artists. Some of them you like, some of them like you, you become friendly, you have coffee, you go visit studios. You go you, to you one studio, around. they'll send you to other studios. Yeah, you get around but it's interesting, there are people who think that you have to pay to go to a gallery. Yeah. That's true. And you also don't have to buy either. I mean, because right. you know, if a gallery thinks that you might someday be a collector, They'll, they're going to spend time with And them. that happened with us, Josh Bear. We yeah. used to go into Josh Bear and look and look. He had a gallery then. At one point we life. said, listen, <laughs> you know, don't waste your time with us. We're, we're really looking, he said. I love educating people. Right. And eventually we started buying from, from the Josh gallery. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And 
Yeah. And Wendy, what about you? I know this is sort of, I don't want you to, to give the milk away for free because this is kind of your job too, but um, but without- no, Not at all, not at all, not at all. I don't see it that way. It's my passion first. It happens to be my job, which is really, which is really amazing. But um, I have a different take from everybody else. And I think it's because um, I, I want to just shout out to Elizabeth D in this art market report and Crozier because we really are in New York and that's what's bringing us all together. And we're one of the, we're, we're just so rich in resources that are free, right? Like galleries, gallerists, they're all so happy to educate people and, and, and museums can be free if you go on free nights and it's really, it's really like an unbelievable resource here that you can take advantage of and, um, I have a slightly different feeling though about how to collect emerging art. So I, you know, out of necessity started to buy emerging art as a young, as a young person in the art world, because that, that, that's what I could afford. But I also was really excited about the art of my time because I, I wanted to engage in that way with art. So, um, my point of entry was really through art history. Um, because I think there's so much out there and you really shouldn't listen to what other people tell you to look at. I mean, I think you really need to have your own confidence about what you're looking at. And if you understand very generally in general terms about art history, you'll have more confidence going to a museum and looking at art. And that's the place to start in a non-commercial place, I think, where you can really just try and wrap your mind around why the artists of the 14th century were painting these subjects or why the artists of the 19th century were painting these subjects and, and what, why does art from different countries look so different? I, you know, New York is like a melting pot. It always has been. You've got, you know, the museums of, of every culture and every race in this, in this city. So it's really fun to go to the China Institute, Japan Society, uh, you know, the just, I mean, God, you could go on and on. So I think you start there. I think you start looking at art of other cultures and times and really understand, get like a little bit of a grounding. You can take free online art history classes. You can listen to free lectures. There are incredible professors lecturing for free um, on demand. You know, um, read a general survey book. Um, and that way, you know, when you're looking at art by a young artist, you can plug it into something. You can say, oh, I get this. This is this artist's lived experience, but it relates to, it, it continues the conversation forward about what art is and why we should care about it. Um, that's how I do it for myself. And, and of course I keep, do a huge amount of educating my clients because they don't, they, they don't have the time or the, or the, they just don't have the time to do that kind of thing. Um, I mean, look at, you know, the way the Horts live their lives. It's really like, it's really their lives, you know? And, and, and a lot of people are, are raising kids or, or working full-time jobs. They just, they don't have the time. So I provide a shortcut. Michael has a full-time job. Yeah, I kind of just, <laughs> but I'll tell you, you know, it doesn't take as much time as you think to do all of that. You gotta not sleep. <laughs> no, that's not true because you like, look, you'll miss things, you'll miss things. I mean, you know, there's so much really good artists, great artists. So you miss them when you miss them. That's how it goes. You know, you can't, you can't get them all. Even we can't. But we like talking to other collectors yeah. and hearing what they're interested in. Yeah. And, and we go and look yeah. sometimes and we try to figure out why this is the you're point. you're really experienced at this point if you're just starting out and you're a novice collector Maybe and you don't and you buy just because someone's telling you oh i like this or i like that you i'm know. telling you when we used to sit down with jack tilton and or every colin saturday Deland or colin so delan and ever and we would sit and talk about the art right and, and they were happy to talk about the art yeah and they would tell this you is what the way we what got, you got our education yeah, yeah. but more than that i mean the joy of it it's, it's certainly important to know a little art history, but the joy of it is the people, in my opinion. That's where we collect contemporary art. If we didn't, you know, if I didn't care about the people, we'd collect 19th century American art. We, honestly, in, in, in the 70s, until 85, basically, my wife, on her own, collected 19th century American art. With a friend of mine. With a friend of it. And I was zero interested. And when she bought her first piece of contemporary art, whose name is Paolo Icaro. Right. 
and when she bought a first piece and called me at work and said, I just bought a piece of contemporary art because I was always there telling the artist he did. Anyway, so I said, so she said, the artist is coming home to hang it with his dealer. And I came home an hour later, we lived in Westchester at the time. And the art looked to me, uh, but boy, was he fun. And that's what got me into it. You know, Elizabeth Fiore just reminded me that we, we were amongst the first to buy Sharin the shot. Right. And she said, photography had a market yeah. back in the 90s. We, well, we, have, we yeah. bought Sydney, Sydney Sherman earlier. We bought uh, Thomas Roof, tons of them. Yeah. Victoria, were you going to say something? I have one more question, but I want to pass to you before I bring us towards the end. I think, I guess, just to win on Wendy's point, I think there is something actually about learning art history that becomes other people telling you what's important too. Like, I just, I don't want to lose that part of it because if we think about who traditionally has been allowed to tell our stories, I think that's a very, it's a, and oftentimes it's a privileged point of view, you know, to have been able to get the PhD and study art history and write about it and help share, sort of define what our cultural narrative is. And so I, I just, I think being cognizant of the, the biases that might be inherent in that are also pretty important when you're trying to craft your own sense of what you like. Definitely looking, going to get to museums is definitely important. Oh, of course, you, you can't just be in the ivory tower, I get that, but I'm involved in academia because I, I'm on the board of my college's museum, and I'll tell you, uh, the education that these professors are putting out is very empowering to changing the narratives, and, and, and academic institutions are on that, so I'm not talking about, you know, your grandmother's art history, it's like a very, very cool thing what's happening on campuses right now in terms of in terms of art history, it's it's exciting. I think also just the fact that there are, you know, that we are sort of slowly coming to terms with the fact that there are multiple histories. Um, and, and so being able to kind of identify, find value in something where there might not have traditionally been value placed on it in the same way is sort of part of the joy of discovery and of collecting also. Um, because you, you know, you're deciding that something is valuable to you. Um, okay, last question for you all, and then I'm going to open it up to some of the great questions that have come in. Um, and this one was also based on a point that Victoria raised before our conversation, which is, you know, we are, we're here to talk about the New York um, ecosystem that is, is sort of the, the reason for us being here. That's the, the guiding principle of the report. But but obviously, you know, no art scene is an island, and even though New York is an island, uh, <laughs> it can't it can't exist without uh, a broader ecosystem. And so, I mean, how do you, in addition to kind of traveling, um, because I assume that that plays a big role um, when it's not lockdown time, um, how do you sort of keep yourself from from becoming too myopic in what you're looking at? How do you um, keep yourself from, from having your collection be just a product of where you are. Um, and maybe we'll start with, um, with the horse. Well, basically, you know, when you're in the art business, as we are for a long time, we get emails uh, from daily from around the world right. that show us the newest art. And, uh, you know, so even if we're not traveling, you certainly yeah. see what's going on. We get catalogs that we, we can read. Um, so that we, 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 we pretty much know what's happening now. I mean, to be honest with you, uh, at the moment, we're buying a lot less art than we did last year. Not that we're not buying art, we're, we're just buying, buying a lot right. less. Yeah, I mean, we buy between 150 and 200 pieces every year. This year, probably 60. And they're probably most of them are New York because we don't buy anything Pretty much, unless we can unless see, we it, see in it in person. If you see it in person, right? Then we. Have I can't just buy from an image. That's why we're not. I don't need. I barely have been looking at the art fairs online, unless it's a gallery that we're interested in an artist we know. Then, right. then I look. Otherwise, right. it's very. Hard. It's hard I because just it, don't. Yeah, it's very hard to really judge art from a picture. You know. Uh, unless you know the art real well. Right. I mean, unless the scale has something well. to do with it. Yeah. You have to get up front in front of a piece yeah. to really decide if this is for you. Yeah, but we, but we, we 
or some art. <laughs> uh, Wendy, both. what about you? How do you sort of keep, keep yourself in a 360 degree view? It's really hard. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I think I miss quite a bit because you can only do so much. And I'm like the horts. I, especially when I'm buying for other people, I, I need to see it. Um, so um, I buy internationally, I buy from galleries all over the world. Um, but I also, you know, I've, I've traveled so much to make those relationships. I've, I've gone to major cities. I go regularly to Los Angeles, which is, you know, a huge hub for emerging art. And um, I, I think it's important to travel and see stuff. And I, um, you know, obviously now that's difficult, but there is a tremendous amount to learn online. And um, here in New York, galleries are open, museums are open. So it's been kind of cool to, to start doing that again. Um, but I think you just, you stay informed. I mean, I read all the blogs, the newsletters. I, um, I belong to a bunch of groups like Artadia, which, you know, is really instrumental in bringing me news about young artists from around the country. Um, I talk to colleagues and friends in China and elsewhere. I, I just try to converse as much as possible, like the Horts do, and, and read as much as I can. And I don't, I really hate sitting in front of a computer. It's really antithetical to how I do my work. So it's been very challenging doing that, but I'm I am doing it because I'm so, I'm so, I'm unstoppable that way. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's how I stay involved. What about you, Victoria? I hate to say it, but social media is like a big, is a big part of it for me. I think I mentioned earlier, finding artists I love and then seeing who they follow. And that's been an eye opener and a tool I've had to get a little bit outside of my orbit, though I have to say in, in focusing on black artists, I am purposefully a little bit focused in what I'm listening out for and paying attention to. So I'm going to transition to some of the fantastic questions that have come in over the transom. Um, and the first one, the Hort sort of um, started to answer it a little bit in the last question, but um, has the willingness of New York City collectors to buy art online increased during the pandemic? I don't know about New York collectors. I know about us. But for you? <laughs> Definitely not. Right, right. Absolutely not. Right. I. I really love going. I actually happen to love going to the galleries. Um, and I'd like to see a gallery show. If you go to an art fair and there's one of a, of a painter or one of a sculptor, and you see one piece at a time, we can't judge by one piece. We're only interested in, in the body of work. <clears throat> right, unless we know the artist. Then unless we know the yeah, artist. If we know fine. the artist, that's fine. I can buy one piece. Uh, Wendy, what about your clients? They've, they've been very willing to buy online. And the funny thing is that it, they always have been. So, you know, like Victoria says that Instagram is, it's true. It's such an unbelievably powerful tool and it, we've all gotten so comfortable. So many people have gotten comfortable with looking at art online. So, and in, you know, pre pandemic, I, I had specific things that I'm always looking for. And when they come up, you know, we might not be able to go see them. They might be in a different country. So, you know, but because we've done the legwork and we feel like we know the artist's work, we'll, we'll buy it online. So uh, yeah, people have been very, very, very willing to buy online. Yeah. And okay, I, what about you? I would just add, I've always been okay with buying online because I really am focused on the person versus, versus the object. And I'm not buying as many things as the horts are by a long, long, long shot. And so I sort of follow artists for enough time that I feel like I, I believe in their values and want to support them and, and the story that they're sharing. And so it ends up being less object-based and more based in what's available, the time, and, and what I happen to see. And so often it is digital sight unseen. And this next question um, is asking for your thoughts on buying from mega galleries whose representation of an artist is tantamount to an endorsement of the artist and its value. 
um, is the name of the gallery you buy and a work from almost, almost as in parentheses, uh, as important as the name of the artist. It isn't for us, uh, but on the other hand, if when David Werner showed young artists, we liked his program, so we looked at it differently. And I'm talking about when he first started. I'm not talking right. about now. Now he doesn't show young artists. Yeah. <laughs> but there are certain galleries we we look at more carefully because over the time we've seen their program and we like their program. Like their eyes, they seem yeah. to have, have similar tastes. But that <clears throat> doesn't mean we won't walk into a gallery where we don't know anything and see something and yeah but also the truth is look if you want to get the best piece from a from an artist from a gallery from a gallery right you it, it's very hard if you don't have a relation with that gallery they have collectors right. that, that they deal with so you know it, you and we always want to get the best piece if well at least what we think what is we the best think piece. Best, right if in fact if if we don't get the best piece and 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 we think the other one is diminished, we'll wait, we won't get it at all. But the point is like David Zwerner, Susan mentioned, in the 90s, we bought 29 out of 30 shows in a row from him that didn't even know it. Until it was, until it was in an art, <laughs> art, an art magazine. It was in an art magazine, that's <laughs> yeah. what I mean. Who gets Luke Toyman? Yeah. Right. yeah, but that's because that's because his sensibility of it at times. We just liked his sensibility. We liked, it. We liked it. We were very friendly with him and liked it. Now we get nothing from him, David. Oh, he's not online. <laughs> um, Wendy or Victoria, do you have anything to add to that? I don't buy from galleries really or go to them that often. I hate to say it, but I, I do to see specific people I sort of already love. And, and then sometimes an artist will direct me back to the gallery. And then of course, and then I- so Are you buying mostly from, directly from the artist and, well, and seeing mostly through studios? I think for me, it's really important to be following artists versus following galleries, just how what resonates with me in terms of how I think about my relationship to art. It's very much about the person that I'm supporting and their creative vision. So I, I start with artists and then sometimes sort of through through them end up with a gallery, but I don't go gallery first. Victoria, I, I have to tell you that we very much it's about the art and it's about the artist. Right. But we, we, we encourage artists to get into galleries and we get artists into galleries because that's the only way they can really make a living in general. There are exceptions, so. For me, it's more about, it's less about where it's bought in the end and to how I find it, where I think I like the discovery uncovered. We find it and we find it all over the place. Right. Yeah. And Wendy, what about you for your clients? I mean, how do you weigh the, because part of it for you, I think it's almost more complicated because people are saying, you know, I am paying you to help me build a collection. And so, you know, you, for you, it's not, I would imagine it's not just going off of passion. You know, you have to have other factors in the mix. So, um, you know, how does the identity of the gallery versus the identity of the artist, how do you weigh those things? For sure. I mean, I think of the galleries as the risk takers because they are the ones committing to an artist and putting their reputation on the line and saying, you know, come and be part of our program. And I, I absolutely have, like the Hortz galleries that I really love their whole program. And um, so I, I'm a repeat, um, I'm a repeat customer, I guess, for lack of a better word. But then I also have galleries that I've, I've only ever bought one thing from them because I, I'm really interested in the artist and they happen to represent that artist. Um, what I've seen happening is a real shell game in the past, like while I've had my business where I'll buy an artist from one gallery, they'll go to another gallery. Um, and it, it kind of, to me, it's really, it's about the collector's vision and helping to accomplish that vision. And I go wherever I have to go to get that done. Um, I'm very strategic about how I work with people. So if someone's got a small budget there, I'm definitely a little more, I'm, I'm a lot more careful um, with young collectors and, and how I direct them because I feel a responsibility and spending their money, so to speak. And I, I really want them to be participating in something that lasts beyond their ownership of it. I, I love, you know, that's, I love emerging art. And so I, I almost feel like a bigger responsibility there in terms of the, how I choose the gallery. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a complicated question. And I'm gonna end with kind of fusing a couple of the questions that have come through, um, which are, are sort of from the perspective of a student um, who is majoring in art history or wants to kind of break into the art world um, and sort of what your advice would be about, you know, what to read, what to look at and how to break into the art world, not necessarily as a collector, but as someone who wants to, you know, exist in that space. Um, so maybe we'll start with uh, Hort. Okay, well, I, th I think that Sotheby's and Christie's have great programs for people to explore. Uh, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> I mean, they should certainly go for a master's if they're really interested in art history. My granddaughter, Rima, is a, a sophomore at Penn, and her, and her love is art history. and. Uh, she works with museums and she uh, she writes quite a lot. And she meets people. You know, I, I, I honestly, the art, art is different than a lot of other disciplines. Although I, I would think if you're a nuclear physicist, talking to other nuclear physicists is pretty useful too. Um, you know, you know it's, I mean, emerging art is not what it sounds like either, by the way, because when you, when you graduate from your um, school, your MFA, your MFA and you're emerging one year later, you're probably in a gallery. So, Sometimes. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if, you, right. if your art looks good. Right? At least that's how it used to be. We'd go to an MFA mm. show and the dealer would be sitting on the Still desk. Is. Yeah, I mean, mm. it, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it, we're quite different, by the way, from the 90s and 80s. Yeah, but I'd like to say that Chicago Art Fair in the 80s and 90s was fantastic Fabulous. at the world's at the, at the pier. And they had great galleries and great, great collectors. collectors. The people in New York were jealous. <laughs> and Victoria, I'm curious, you know, for you, especially if you are someone who is in college, but, or, you know, but doesn't necessarily have the resources. Sorry, my dog is just in the background. <laughs> Don't worry. I, he's been fighting to get on screen. <laughs> um, if you are, if you are someone who doesn't necessarily have the resources for a graduate degree or, you know, are kind of trying to, to spin this, this, entree and education more um, more at home, you know, what would you recommend that they do? Well, I, I have to tell you, first of all, a, a young collector, I always tell them buy works on paper. It's a great way to start, mm -hmm. and not too expensive. Um, my son, many, many years ago, uh, came to me, he had $400 and he wanted to buy a poster. There's and I apartment. said, no way, I won't <laughs> let you do that. I'll take you to see some young artists and they do works on paper, you never know. And he lands up buying a Glen Ligon oil stick for $400. From Porter's house, he sold for 170,000. Right, right. But another great way for a young collector is, is benefit auctions, because very often time work goes for half price. I mean, our, our foundation gets great art, and it, and and it gets in, it goes in sometimes. It sometimes. Really, sometimes it doesn't, but often yeah. it does if you look. Yeah. But we've bought some great things. We bought a, a Andrea Zatel yeah. drawing from, I John think knows. it was a bomb auction or something, yeah. $50. Right. This drawing was in her retrospective at the Shalaga. Yeah. It was in her, <laughs> all her retrospectives, <laughs> this tiny little drawing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This is just one example. Look, just the, the, real thing is, look, the real thing is, look, we, we, we collect differently, but on the other hand, it's pure joy. I mean, I mean, anyone could buy a John Curran, but to buy the first one at White Columns, which we did for two grand, that every time you see John Curran, he's a big guy, he comes and hugs you because it convinces mommy to be an artist. What's that worth? <laughs> That's amazing. Victoria, what about you? It's amazing. So cool to hear. Um, we read lots of stories, but it's over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think uh, your question was about collecting about working Julia it was about like sort of gaining um entry into the art world you know sort of what should you what would you recommend people read or what would you recommend that they do if they're young they're still in college or they're starting out and they want to kind of make their way yeah I, I think I, it de it's so dependent on what they want to do I don't know if I have a universal answer besides that 
I think what's what worked for me was trying everything out, you know, being being willing to to help out in my spare time after school at the Yale Art Gallery and and just trying to get get my hands dirty and in actually like learning what it would be like to work with art, but also starting to develop relationships with folks who worked within at my school, there was a, a university art gallery. So being able to get to know them and have them make recommendations for me based on knowing me, what I should read, who I should follow. I think mentorship is really important in the field. And if you can find people who share your values, just ask them. But I, I don't know if I have a, a just overarching. Um, That's a good but, one. But, but write to me and tell me a little bit about yourself and I'd be happy to, to come up with something. And Wendy, what about you? Especially, we'll we'll end with you as a uh, as a born and bred New Yorker who I imagine used the city as her own sort of textbook. Well, I love what Victoria said about the internship because I was really really lucky with my, one of my college intern internships to meet my lifelong mentor, who's like a second mother to me and has opened so many doors for me in the art world and is so beloved in the New York art world that I really benefited from you know, all of her mentoring, but also her relationships because she was so, she took me everywhere with her. And um, I, I guess one thing I will say is that we all know that the art world doesn't really pay well. So a great time to get your chops wet is when you live at home and you're still not, it's not incumbent on you to make a salary. There are so many internships you can do in the city um, and in any city um, in terms of you know free work, galleries, museums, and you just start building your relationships and passion goes a long way. Like eager, passionate people. I get calls all the time from people looking for internships. You know, I can tell in three seconds when someone's got the what I want, you know, that kind of like, yeah, I'm really down for anything. And you know, that open-mindedness and um, willing to work hard, but like definitely build your network while you're young. And it's a business that loves young people, youthful energy. Um, definitely mentors are really key seeking out mentors. And um, I think also just, um, you know, you don't have to work in the art world to be in the art world. You know, you can absolutely have your career separate from the art world and be a part of the art world that is a thing too so and maybe a better thing <laughs> than yeah working. I mean I I think that's a great point I think that you know the the I would love to see an art world that paid for even you know volunteer what, what used to be volunteer labor I think that it would create an art world that would be even stronger and 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 sort of uh less uh restricted to people who can afford to work for free uh, than, than it is now. Um, but I think that, you know, people who feel like this, this world is off limits to them, knowing that, you know, you don't have to work in it, only in it to, to benefit from it. I think that that is such a valuable piece of information. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank you so much to our panelists. For, for taking your, um, your evening and spending it with us. We really, really appreciate your insight. Um, we have recorded this, so if anybody wants to share it or watch it later, we will um, upload it in the next few days to YouTube and to the um, post on our website. Um, and, and yeah, thank you again. And thank you to the producers of the New York Art Market Report who um, gave us a reason to gather here and talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Meeting you both. Julia. Thank, Thank you. George, Wendy. It was so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you both.